Grace and peace to you from Onalaska First United Methodist Church. You're listening to our podcast. We hope you enjoy. Okay, I'd like you all to stand up and greet each other this morning. And as you do, I want you to tell your neighbor what your favorite Beatles song is. Okay. Bring it on back. Bring it on back. You should have thought of your favorite song by now. Elvis. Elvis. Okay, tell me some of the songs. What were some of the songs named? Uh, Jim said... Yellow Submarine. Excellent. Penny Lane. Which one? Oh, okay, yes. Morning has... Okay. Hey, Jude. Okay, Matt, what's your favorite? Hey, Jude, that's a good one. That's a good one. You know, Hey, Jude, even now when Paul does his concerts, he always ends with Hey, Jude, and it goes on forever and ever and ever at the end, and he lets the crowd sing forever and ever, and then he finally ends it. Great song, great song. Oh, you looked at the bulletin. You looked at the bulletin, didn't you? Yes. So... As you probably have figured out by now, I am a Beatles fan. I have Lennon Micah, and do you know what Legend's middle name is? It's McCartney. (laughs) Legend McCartney. I am a Beatles fan. If you pressed me, though, I don't know if I could give you a favorite Beatles song. That's hard to do. Maybe Hey Jude. It's It's a tough one. Yesterday... The long and winding road, the long and winding road. My guitar gently weaves. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I don't know that I could pick out a favorite one. But there is one song that has become somewhat iconic. I mean, they're all iconic. But but one especially, I think, that has just gone down in history as an iconic Beatles song. And that is All You Need Is Love. Now... Just to give you some interesting tidbits about this particular song, this was not, All You Need Is Love was not released on an album originally. It was written as a single uh, in 1967. There was, I think the BBC was going to do uh, this new thing called satellite television. They were going to do a program called Our World, and it was going to be broadcast to 18 different countries. And they were going to have a wide variety of talent on there. And of course, they wanted the Beatles. And so Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, was excited about it and said, the boys will do it. And he signed them up for it. And he ran back to the studio and said, guys, guess what I just booked for you? This satellite program called Our World. It's going to be later next year. And y'all are going to be on it. It's going to be great. Well... You know, it, you know, the Beatles were a little bit uh, cantankerous or rebellious at times. They were not so thrilled about it. They said, Brian, you should have talked to us before you signed us up for this gig, but we'll do it. And Brian said, oh, well, there's one other thing. The show, the producers of the show want to know if you will write a special song just for this show. And they said, yes, we'll do it, Brian. But then they waited. They waited, and they waited, and they kept procrastinating, and Brian was starting to get nervous. He kept checking in, going, you boys write that song yet for the show? It's coming up, you know, a couple months, it's it's happening, did you write the song yet? They said, oh, we'll write it, we'll write it. Well, eventually, they wrote All You Need Is Love. Now, actually, John Lennon was the one who wrote the bulk of the song. He wrote all the words, most of the music, the other guys contributed a little bit they added some things but for the most part John wrote it and this is what Brian Epstein said he said it was an inspired song and they really wanted to give the world a message the nice thing about it is that it cannot be misinterpreted it is a clear message saying that love is everything and it's true all you need is love is doesn't have complicated lyrics I mean, the chorus, all you need is love, da 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 all you need is love, da 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 I mean, that's it, right? Here's what McCartney said. He said, well, it was certainly tailored to the broadcast once we had it, 
But I've got a feeling it was just one of John's songs that was coming anyway. I love that. John Lennon. You know, John had his ups and downs in life, had a tragic ending. But I think in this moment, writing this song, I think John was on to something. In fact, I think he hit the nail right on the head. And even though St. Paul died 1,900 years before this song was written, I think that Paul would have agreed. In fact, I think Paul probably would have been a Beatles fan had he been around. But Paul would have agreed with the notion that all you need is love, I do believe. We have been talking the last couple of weeks about Paul's thoughts on gifts and the makeup of the church. In fact, we've been looking at his letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, And you may recall that the church in Corinth was in some division. Uh, They had written a letter to Paul and said, could you straighten this out for us? But they had been fighting about gifts. There were certain people within the church that had the ability to speak other languages. And again, we don't know if these are supernatural languages or if they just knew extra human languages. But they had this ability and they're kind of goading the others who can't speak these languages. And it was a source of strife within the church. And so Paul is trying to settle this dispute. And so two weeks ago, we looked at how Paul made the claim that everybody has received a gift Nobody is without a gift. It just so happens some people can speak other languages and that's their gift. But God has gifted everybody. And then last week, Paul went on to say, well, not only have you been gifted, but every single person is essential to the life of the church. If you are not using your gift, if you think that because your gift isn't somebody else's gift, then you're just going to bow out. You are tragically mistaken because God has not called you here by accident. You are here on purpose. So this is where Paul has kind of laid out his argument. And we're going to wrap it up today, even though Paul is going to continue on for another chapter. If you would like this week, you can read chapter 14. But we are going to look at chapter 13, uh, where Paul continues his thoughts. This is the famous um, love chapter. You may have heard this most likely in a wedding. Chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is almost always read at weddings. The problem is it really was not intended for a wedding. I mean, I guess it works, but Paul is not talking about the love between two people who are joining into a lifelong covenant together. He's talking to a church that's fighting over gifts. That was the context in which this is written. However, chapter 13 may be, if all you need is love, is it may be the, the most popular Beatles song. 1 Corinthians 13 may be the most popular Bible chapter in all the Bible. I don't know. When we get into it, you'll recognize. You'll start to go, oh yes, I've heard that before. So, I would like for you, if you have your Bibles, turn to that. 1 Corinthians Chapter 13, we'll start in verse 1. This is what he says. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, But do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. See, it's interesting here. I'm going to pause there for just a second because Paul has just spent a lot of time telling them you all have received gifts and telling them you all need to use your gifts because it forms one whole body, the church. But then... He lays out this warning to them. And here is the warning. The warning is, he's anticipating. Okay, now I've told you that you all have a gift, but just in case you think that you just go ahead and start using your gift, I've got to tell you that any gift 
that is exercised apart from love, you are just wasting your time. Not only are you wasting your time, you're wasting God's time, and you're wasting everybody else's time. Because using your gift apart from love doesn't do anything. It gains nothing. It is worthless. Because love is the thing which undergirds the gift that you've been given and empowers it to be fruitful for God. Love. Now, as I was writing this, I thought, I was thinking, you know, in English, love is kind of a, it's kind of a strange word, right? Because I could say, well, I love God. And you all know what I'm talking about. I love God. But then I could say, well, I love my wife. But I don't love my wife the same way that I love God. Those are two different types of love. I, I could say I love Melvin. I don't love Melvin the same way I love my wife. Those are two different types of love. Guess what? I love Snickers bars. I love Snickers bars. But I don't love Snickers bars the same way that I love God or Melvin or my wife. But yet I use the word love in all of those scenarios. So love just kind of gets thrown out there. We just kind of toss it out there, you know, in the English language. And you're just expected to know what it all means. Well, the Greeks were a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, they recognized that there were different types of loves. And so they had three different words that they used for love. The first of those is phileo. Say phileo. phileo. Phileo is where we get the English word like philanthropist or the city of Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia is what? The city of brotherly love. So that gives you some idea of what phileo is. Phileo is just a natural love that you experience for other people. Your siblings, your friends, co-workers, whoever. When you experience that love, that is phileo. Just the natural love that you have for your fellow human beings. The next one is kind of a step up from that. It is Eros. Say eros. eros. It is where we get the words erotic. This is a sexual type of love. So this is another level of intimacy within the categories of love. Eros is not found in the New Testament anywhere, but it is in the Greek language. It's one of the words that they used. But the third and the highest form of love, and by far the favored in the New Testament, is agape. Say agape. Agape. Agape is the divine love. This is the love we are told that God has for us. But not only that, not only is it God love, we are told, we are commanded to agape God. We are to turn around and send that divine love back to God. So in other words, we don't love God the same way we love our friends, and we don't love God the same way we love our spouses. We love God in a completely different way. But not only that, Jesus says, you know how you phileo each other? I want you to agape each other. I want you to move your love, your brotherly love, your friendly love, I want you to bump it up a couple notches. I want you to love each other that way. And then... Jesus says, oh yeah, I also want you to agape your enemies. <sighs> Come on, Jesus. How am I going to do that? You see, agape is the most costly form of love that there is. Because agape requires that we give of ourselves it's a sacrifice. Just like God sacrificed himself for us, God agaped us. We are to love one another in the same way. And we are to love our enemies in the same way. And we are to love God in the way that he has loved us. I love 1 John 4.16. 1 John 4.16 says, God is love. God is agape. 
Those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. It's a very interesting way to say it. God does not just love, God is love. His very essence, his nature is agape. That's fantastic. And so that means that if you are abiding in that agape, that God dwells within you and is loving through you, just like I told Vivian. If love is in you, God is in you. And wherever you encounter love in the world, you are encountering God. Because God is love. So we're going to continue in the chapter because Paul now is going to define that love. He's going to define agape for us. This is where you've probably heard it in a wedding. Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I think the NRSV got it wrong right there. Other translations say love never fails. The Greek word says love never falls, never falls down. Love never fails. So the interesting thing, an interesting experiment then, if God is love, would be to replace the word agape. We just read, we defined love. Let's plug God back in there. And let's see if this is the picture we get in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth to reveal God to us. We see what God is like in Jesus. Let's see if this is true. God is patient God is kind. God is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. God does not insist on his own way. God is not irritable or resentful. God does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but he rejoices in the truth. God bears all things. God believes all things. God hopes all things. God endures all things. God never fails. That's true. Isn't that awesome? That's the picture we see in Jesus. God is love. And then Paul is going to drive home his point. He's been telling them about gifts and unity, but he has just gone to great lengths to tell them the importance of love undergirding everything that they do as the church. And so then Paul is going to drive home his point, picking it up in 8. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. And now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. (laughs) Paul says, you think your gifts are special? They are, but they're temporary. Because there's going to come a day when you don't need to prophesy anymore. You don't need to speak other languages You don't need to be a good administrator or server or preacher or teacher or knowledgeable because we will be made like Jesus. 
complete and whole and in the very presence of God who is love. And when that day comes, all of these things that you're fighting about, church, all these things that are causing division, they won't even matter anymore. Mm. And then he says, but faith, hope, and love will remain. They are eternal. But the greatest of these is love, agape. So I'm going to pose this question to you this morning. I hope over the last couple of weeks you've just been thinking about what is my gift and how am I called to use it in the church for the whole? How, how is God calling me to do that? But my question to you this morning is, as you are figuring that out and you're using your gifts, some of you are using your gifts all the time, uh, every week. I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. But as you're using those gifts, are you doing them in love? Are you displaying agape? Is agape undergirding everything that you do? When you serve each other, are you trying to be patient and kind? Are you trying to be less jealous and resentful of each other? Less boastful? Less rude and irritable toward one another? I can be rude and irritable to my children sometimes. That's not agape. Are you bearing up under each other? Are you enduring with each other as we go through trials? Are you bearing up under one another? Are you believing and hopeful? When, when it says love believes all things and hopes all things, think about your neighbor. Is your first reaction to somebody, well, that person's just trying to pull the wool over my eyes, or that person has it out for me. That's not agape. Agape says, I'm hoping that I am misinterpreting this. I am hoping and believing that my neighbor has agape God within himself or herself. And maybe I'm just making stuff up. I'm hoping that's the truth. That's what agape looks like. doesn't mean you're right. Your neighbor might be getting over on you. They might be trying to <laughs> stick it to you. But agape's first reaction is to hope and believe that that is not the intent. Are you rejoicing with one another? Paul says, we're just like children. We're all gazing in a bad reflection Months and months and months ago, I had the polished bowl. You remember that? I held up the polished metal. That's what Paul's talking about. Like, we're just kids. We're just looking in this bad reflection. We're just, we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to look more and more like Jesus. But the good news is, Paul says that someday we will be made perfect and all will be known. But in the meantime, Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ dwells within you and is literally changing you from the inside out. In fact, Paul says that when you received Christ, you are the old has passed away and the new has come. You are a new creation where you stand today. You are not the same creature that you were before you accepted Christ. That transformative process has already begun within you. Don't fight it. Give yourself over to agape. And know that even though you're going to make mistakes, that God is doing a work within you and He is faithful to complete that which He started. 
see the Beatles were right. John was right. All you need is love. If love is undergirding everything that you do, man, you can't go wrong. Before you do any act of service, just ask yourself this question. Am I doing this in love? Or am I doing this because I'm obligated to do it? Or I feel pressured to do it? Or it's just what's expected of me? Or any other motivation? If that is the way that you are approaching any task that you're going to do, I encourage you just to step back for a second Ask God to make love the reason for your service and then continue on. Don't not do it. Don't not do it. But just make sure love is the thing that is fueling your service. And if you can use your gifts in love, it will make all the difference in the world.